Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Bott. Uh, I am the director of Rutgers Arts Online. And as Natalia said, this presentation today uh, is about a journey that I have been on with my colleagues, all of uh, whom are represented here uh, on the screen, and, and then dozens more um, uh, instructors and uh, administrative and staff colleagues uh, throughout Rutgers as we have attempted to redesign, uh, really completely begin an overhaul of a program that started uh, in 2007. And I'll just give you a brief history of, of Rutgers Arts Online, uh, henceforth RAO, as we call it. Uh, it started as a pilot in, in 2007 with one music faculty member teaching two online courses. Uh, and, and from there, it went on to become the largest online program at Rutgers University. Uh, and in the uh, semester immediately preceding uh, the, the pandemic, we were serving nearly 10,000 students in more than 100 courses. Uh, some of those numbers have uh, dropped off during uh, the height of COVID and we're quickly uh, getting back up to those levels. And I should note that from the beginning, uh, our courses have been 100% asynchronous. Um, and yet, perhaps counterintuitively, the pandemic, which was uh, you know, a moment for many um, to realize how, how much they needed to get online, um, it actually showed us this, this large, uh, prosperous program uh, where we were not as advanced as our numbers might suggest. Um, so I was hired just a year ago uh, in the spring semester of 22. And at that point, the program had been without a director or a technical director for six months. Uh, both were casualties of the challenges of work and life that we all uh, faced in different ways during the height of COVID. Uh, and these departures caused no small amount of disruption and chaos. Um, and it led to the fall 21 semester uh, being held together uh, by, you know, wire and duct tape by an administrative assistant and, and Mason Gross's associate dean uh, for academic learning. Well, uh, as any leader knows and, and uh, any aspiring leader should remember, there is uh, no better situation to come into than one marked by chaos and disruption uh, because the crisis uh, becomes your opportunity to make an immediate impact. Uh, so it wasn't a terrible thing for me coming into a new position uh, to find that there was work to do um, and there was, was I thought, some low-hanging fruit. So what I'm going to talk about briefly, and then I'm going to get off the stage and, and allow my colleagues to share the nuts and bolts of some of these changes, uh, is how did, I, how did I approach the challenge uh, and, and how I approached it was with knowledge and experience from my background as a theater artist, uh, as the title says. I started with the art um, and, and no small amount of organizing. Uh, theater is a collaborative process and that's how I saw this endeavor. So let me just show you what I, what I started with, what I saw when I came to Rutgers Arts Online. Uh, this is an example of a course, uh, a look that will be familiar to many of you. It's a standard Canvas course. Um, and there's not a heck of a lot to say about it. This is one of the sample courses we would show online as a way to entice prospective students to come take a class with us. And as you can see, it is very much text-based. Uh, to me, it's not very engaging. The technological innovation is uh, simply a series of YouTube thumbnails. Uh, it's a very passive course, and um, in, in point of fact, it's not what I would call online learning. Uh, I would uh, come to call this a, a book on a screen uh, with some YouTube videos. So what were the questions I was asking myself? Well, first of all, how do we make these courses more engaging for students? It, it's, um, as we all know uh, from, from our social media lives, the promise of connection through social media um, is often a very isolating experience. And in uh, listening to students and faculty, I felt that their experience in Canvas was in fact somewhat isolating. Um, so how do we make this more engaging? Um, how do we improve um, and get up to speed on our uh, educational techno uh, technology tools, the ed tech tools in the course, uh, and thus 
conform to what in 2022 and 2023 are best educational practices for online learning. Um, how do we make this less boring? We're an art school, Mason Gross School of the Arts. Um, what sorts of things can we do um, just to give an aesthetic that lets students know they're in a different kind of learning environment uh, than in other schools at the, at, at the university? Um, what could we do in Canvas, um, which has its own limitations? And I think the overriding questions that I still wrestle with daily is, how do we teach the arts online, um, which are different than uh, other kinds of courses? And I don't think that's a question that's been answered fully, um, even through the pandemic and beyond. Um, and so those were the questions I asked, but I knew also that I had collaborators in my instruct instructors and potential collaborators somewhere in the university. Uh, and I was lucky that uh, one of the first calls I made was to uh, TLT, Teaching and Learning with Technology, and connected with Will Pagan and Dina, who's here. Uh, and we started discussing my vision for what I wanted this to be. Um, we talked about the limitations of Canvas. And one of the first things that I decided was, we're going to give this a facelift. And we're going to make the aesthetic dimension different from what I just showed you. And so we came across a Canvas plugin called City Labs. And TLT put its programmers and its designers to work. Uh, and we began to create a different interface for Canvas. Uh, and then I had to find the instructors that we had on our roster who had interesting courses uh, and who might be willing to jump into this project of exploring what it would mean to redesign the course. And with that, I am going to um, allow those questions to linger and, and um, put them now as I did to my instructors. Uh, and I'm going to start with, with Jen, uh, who teaches a graphic design course. Uh, to say, what are the questions and challenges that you're confronting in teaching this asynchronous design course? Um, and how might a partnership uh, trying to redesign this course be useful to you? Um, so Jen, take us through how you started and, and get us into some of the details of, of what this redesign project started to look like. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, actually, it's funny you, you mentioned the duct tape chaos period, which was literally my first semester at RAO. Um, and uh, while I have six years previous to that teaching in person in studio, my experience teaching online was at that point very limited. Um, you know, I had about 30 minutes worth of Canvas tutorials. So um, I was really excited about that opportunity to, um, to re-envision uh, this class that I had built online. And so getting paired uh, with TLT and with the instructional designer, Karen Harris, um, she helped me uh, find all the nooks and crannies of Canvas and tools I just had no idea even existed. Um, and so that was really amazing. It, what you had said about um, it being you know, passive, I did find that these, these scrolling screens of text and pictures um, was not at all the interactive uh, space that I wanted for my studio class. Um, and uh, so she, so Karen really helped me find um, a lot of tools. I'm pretty good at Googling how to do stuff, but there was stuff I didn't even know existed. Um, so that partnership experience was, was amazing. Um, and, you know, my experience has also been in the studio. Um, I, whether it was working or teaching, I'm used to being in a space with other people and being able to walk students through um, what they're learning and why they're learning it in person. And so Karen also um, really helped me understand how to make that material more accessible um, to students in an online space. Um, so one of the things that was actually interesting about that partnership was that um, I, obviously I come from a visual communication background. I've been doing graphic design for, for a few decades now, and I work in you, you know, user experience and website design. And so, um, and Karen, of course, has had a, an experience with a wide uh, array of course types. 
And so that combined experience um, made it really interesting to sort of test drive uh, the template, the City Labs template early on. And so um, I'm going to uh, share the screen um, so that we can see it. There, okay. So what we're seeing here is, um, as Kevin was sharing earlier, a very typical Canvas page, uh, the modules page. And now in the City Labs template, this doesn't change. This space um, stayed uh, the, the same Canvas look. Um, and it's while this page is a nice box um, for all the stuff that you have to throw into it, all of the, all of the materials that students are gonna interact with, after a couple of modules, all of those materials look exactly the same to the student. It's just kind of a, a visual wash of stuff over the page. And so one of the things Karen and I did um, in trying to re envision how to use this template was leverage this overview page that um, Kevin integrated into the template for all REO classes. And every module has an overview page. So uh, a student would get to this space at the beginning of every module. Um, you can see at the top here, there is a, um, you know, a graphic interface that looks different than the typical Canvas space. This is the, the, uh, the template header that would be on every content page within an REO course. Um, and down here, every module opens with, with a video. A, like we sort of have a little bit of a connection there um, by the time that we maybe engage in one-on-one -on -one reviews later on in the semester. Um, of course, there's a text overview and learning objective bullet points, but what's really useful about this overview page is that it is an opportunity to take the module components and reconstitute them in a more sort of like um, conversational way in that, you know, what a student really wants to know is what do I have to read and watch this week and what do I have to turn in? And so um, Karen and I basically put this, this page together uh, as just copying literally every element from the modules page, adding hyperlinks. And so the student within a week doesn't really ever have to go back to that module page. And that was something else that was important um, from more of a programmatic kind of point of view is that one of the experiences that we have, or at least that I had, is that students are taking their non-majors, they're not necessarily familiar with the uh, rigor and process of um, you know, iterative exploration. So um, giving the page a, a look that tells them they're stepping into a new space. This is, this is an art space. Um, and the header really helps that. Um, so one of the other issues that I had um, that I was struggling with was that in order to make work um, manageable for students to get to acquire all the skills that I wanted them to acquire in the 15 weeks that I had, there are lots of different kinds of assignment types. And in a, in, a, in a studio space, that was pretty easy because we had differentiated hours in the classroom and we had hours out of the classroom. In this space, all of the hours are out of the classroom. So things started to blend together. Um, and so the, the City Labs template afforded a way of differentiating content in a way that the regular pages didn't. So for example, um, I could, click on any one of these, say I'm going to check out a lecture, I can click straight to the lecture from this overview page. Um, and here's the lecture branded with the, um, the RAO header again, so that I always have that in there. I always know I'm in this space. And this reads pretty much like a page. Um, but I also can differentiate, I always have a button here that takes me back to the week's overview if I'd like and I can choose something else from there. If I wanna see an exercise, an assignment page, it looks different. It still has these buttons here, but that it has this header that can be color coded for different kinds of assignments. And that was very important to me. Um, one of the other aspects of this is that City Lab allows um, chunking of information on the page, which because some of these assignments are very complex, uh, made it a lot more manageable for students. And I could utilize the, the functionality of these sort of twirling down accordion pages 
to break down the steps in a way that was much more scannable for students. And also for me, I have to say that being able to have this kind of interaction made it a lot easier for me to organize my content. Um, here's another assignment type. It's a multi-paid, multi-week um, assignment. And this one gives students a way of seeing all of the different stages of this assignment. They may not be able to access the specific page yet because it hasn't been unlocked, but they have a chance to actually see what's ahead of them in um, a more accessible way that differentiates from the other kind of material that's on the page. Um, you'll see this little button here at the top. This is actually a link to an external um, uh, app called mural.co and one of the aspects of this top nav that we wanted to retain was that this button was always something that might be um, co community oriented maybe it's a discussion forum or in my case i will show you in a second it's it's a sort of um uh, uh virtual wall to pin your work up on. But we wanted that to be front and center um, on the top of every page so that students know when they engage in an arts online class that being part of a community is part of the expectation. This is not a kind of, you can't sit in the back of a class in a studio, right? You are, everybody is important in the community. Um, and so this would, um, one of the things that I worked with with Karen was um, trying to address something that I experienced very viscerally in March of 2020, when we um, put our studio class had to obviously out of necessity go online. And what I really noticed was that students didn't miss me particularly. I could still engage with them via Zoom in a way that was, was still pretty meaningful, but what they missed was the, each other. Uh, my students had created a cohort for the, of support um, in the studio when they were working. And they also had that experience of walking in um, on a day when something was due and pinning things up on the wall and seeing their work in the context of others. So um, I wanted to uh, replicate that online if I could. So I turned to a, an app um, a browser-based app that came across my into my my view during that period in in 2020 called Mural.co, and what it is is basically just a um, infinite canvas that students um, I can actually put areas with their names and they can actually share work. Um, it's very flexible. They can move things around. We can expand them. And it really replicates that experience of seeing their work on the wall next to other people's. Um, it also allows for iterations when they're working on um, projects and experimenting with different options. And this really, I have to say that I found that this space actually was almost better than trying to have, um, you know, milestone conversations with students in the real world um, because, you um, we could actually play with the cropping tools. We could say, well, what if? And they could say, oh, I actually have that sketch in my, my folder here. Let me put this up on the wall too. They didn't have to go print something out. We could see things in a much quicker space. Um, it also allowed, uh, this is a game that it's, um, it's a sort of a visual dominoes that helps students understand the relationships between forms, right? Circles to circles, blue to blue, textures to textures. And with a little bit of formatting in the assignment, they were able to use this virtual space to actually play the game with each other and take turns and at the same time learn something about form. So I found that this app worked really well. Now it's not integrated with Canvas, but this is something that Karen actually helped me understand is that the embed code that's available for a lot of apps, a lot of external apps, um, can be actually made to be part of the Canvas page. And so you know, I have 100 students in several sections. And while they're getting something from their group in the mural space, it's also very beneficial for them to see what everybody else is doing, right? They have 100 people that they can actually um, see. And so this page right here is a, is a canvas page. Um, you can see the header there again, but it's got an embed uh, preview of all of the mural pages. So um, that I also found to be, I would never have known to be able to use that tool. About one um, minute, Jen. Yeah. 
Well, no, so that's just, um, that's about it. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and, and just to say, you know, that these tools um, were really important um, for me to, for the students to be able to comment on what I, I actually um, didn't get a chance to really look into, but was the way that students actually can talk about individual things that other students have done. And it's much more organic. Um, that it isn't a threaded response and they don't, you know, if they weren't the first person to comment, it doesn't really matter because it all kind of is in the same space. So. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. That, that's great. I'm, I'm going to transition and kick it to you, Sean. Um, Sean, of course, you teach rock and roll origins to present and, and same thing. What are the questions and challenges that you were um, asking yourself as you went into this project with your instructional designer, Natalia? Um, thanks, Kevin. Uh, well, I'll start by just kind of giving a very brief introduction to myself and my experience with RAO. Um, I came from this very edit from a different place uh, from Jen. Um, I have been with RAO since 2010, 2011. Uh, Kevin is actually my fourth director now. Um, so the more things change. Uh, so uh, my first course I developed was um, I was actually in the Rutgers newer jazz history program when I was approached to write a uh, jazz, uh, what was originally a jazz appreciation course, which turned into um, uh, African American music in the 20th century course um, that kind of started my journey. I taught all the way through doing a PhD and um, now have a PhD and have been working with the department for that whole time. Uh, so in 2013, I was approached by the then uh, technical director, asked, do you want to teach a rock and roll course? I said, sure, why not? Uh, and that was originally developed um, in 2012, 2013 uh, in e-college. Uh, we brought it over to Canvas in 2017. Um, and uh, when Kevin approached me last spring uh, to say, are you interested in this redesign? Um, I thought, thought it was a great opportunity to grow more skills for myself, grow the course, um, and get a new experience. So the uh, first step of that really was um, a review from TLT, and that was actually done by Natalia and Dina, who are here with us today. Um, and I think Natalia is going to tell you a little bit about the process from her end. Uh, Natalia also ended up being the instructional designer that I worked with uh, in the process, and then we'll come back to me to talk through a, a few of the things we, we tweaked and added and modified. Thank you, Sean. Um, yes, it was a pleasure to work with Sean. And as you can hear from his experience, uh, he already had a very well developed course with uh, wonderful content. So we had to go really with a fine comb to, 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 to uh, examine it and find the areas where we can improve that even further. And one thing I want to pay attention uh, to, or actually bring your attention to, is how we went about aligning everything. Um, Jen uh, did a great job showing you template and that's the template that we use for all courses but when I started working with Sean that wasn't our main um, main goal we really uh, went through his course and we start by uh, developing a course map I'm going to show you on the screen what course map is and what we used um, so give me just one second. Uh, there you go. You should be able to see it right now. So this is the course map that we uh, created for rock and roll course. And um, as you see at the beginning, we list the course learning objectives. And that became the guiding objectives for the rest of the content. And as I said, Sean already had a lot of content developed, so we really just had to kind of realign it and make sure that uh, we developed a module level objective for each module. And then we uh, placed information about the lectures, different assignments, different uh, activities, different discussion, assessment, everything that had to take place with each module. And that was kind of uh, one of the main things we had to do, make sure right, it's sorry, aligned. And uh, Sean did a wonderful you. job aligning every, every module level objective with activities and with uh, different assessments. Um, he, he did, um, he looked at the uh, objectives and he created assignments. 
uh, and assessments to make sure that uh, it was uh, it was very tightly aligned, and that was very very important because now the whole course, like you really can, you really can make sure that it, everything is purposeful. There's no extra activity that are not aligned to meet the module level and therefore to meet the course level objectives. After we completed that project, uh, then we went about how to. Um, let's review each module and review each assignment, each activity. What can we do to make it more interactive for students, more interesting for students? And uh, Sean uh, did again, wonderful job um, achieving that. So I'm gonna uh, kick it back uh, to Sean and he will tell you about some examples of activities and as assessments that he changed or added to his uh, already well-designed course. Uh, thank you, Natalia. You didn't have to say that many nice things about me, but I appreciate it all the same. Um, so yeah, as I, as I mentioned, and yeah, thank you. Um, we started, uh, a lot of the lecture material was there. So my lectures looked a lot like um, slightly more uh, interactive versions of what Kevin showed in that uh, I embed video throughout and, and images and um, different ways of kind of interacting with the material rather than just text and links. Um, so what I want to look at real quick is um, assessments and activities wise, we were, I had essentially discussion forums and listening responses, which are still in discussion forum spaces. Um, and the goal here was to both make those better um, and to add more interactive experiences. So you can see here, this is a module overview, much like what you saw with um, in Jen's course, we have the, the, the design here. Um, if you scroll down, we have our the objectives that Natalia was just talking about. And then we have our tasks that are linked through here. So this particular module, which is a week in length, has three lectures, uh, an introduction to the Beatles, a discussion of the British blues boom focused on like the Rolling Stones, and then a Beach Boys oriented lecture, um, Best of the West Coast, which also deals with surf rock, et cetera. And then we have our activities for the module, um, which are a listening response, um, and we also have um, a, what I created with this particular, I had some other prompt, I don't even recall what it was, but uh, I tried to re-envision this to be a little bit more interactive. So I went with this idea of a debate, uh, which is something I've done in live classes uh, and similar topics before. Uh, and the idea was debate the Rolling Stones, Beach Boys, or the Beatles, which had the longest uh, impact on the future of rock, et cetera. Um, and one of the things, that we we're able to do and Natalia introduced me to was the group um, discussion options. So instead of this being the same 40 people in your section that you talk with all the time, I created smaller groups of 20 that are cross sections. So we have two cr sections cross listed, 80 students coming from, you know, that in the books are from different sections, uh, but this is a chance for them to interact with different folk than they're necessarily used to talking to. Um, and one of the, and the prompt is not only make your case, but find an opposing uh, position to counter argue and then offer some positive feedback. Um, this is just one sample of an original post in favor of the Beatles. Um, I'm posting this because I, I think it's very well deep. It has a nice level of detail and you can see the student not only indicates um, what it is that they think is the main point, but then they come, they have the, uh, the counter argument here uh, against the Rolling Stones, which I think is a uh, pretty interesting, you know, they fulfilled the, uh, the prompt very well and they also uh, cited an external source. And this is one of the, and I will say that almost everybody went for the Beatles. Uh, I'm gonna have to tweak the instructions to force some people into taking other positions, but uh, this, um, this student was uh, a little more adventurous and went for the case of the Rolling Stones. So we can see here the first, the initial comment, the response. And I also love that the student posted, they embedded um, from Spotify an example that they're using. So it's kind of in the space, we can listen to the music, um, uh, not only read the text. So this, I think it's a really great way to use this, um, this tool. Uh, which again is it's a standard discussion forum. It's not this is not unlike what I did in e-college in 2010, but we're able to kind of tweak what we're asking and then have the opportunity to embed. And we all I make a point of early in the course showing them how to embed, how to share media so that they can do it in these um, these different courses. Uh, so there's just a couple, I want to move these through these pretty quickly, but there's a few other um, 
newer assignments that we designed uh, with this relaunch. And one was this uh, a project to share a festival poster. This module is about music festivals in the late 60s. So we talk about Altamont and Monterey and Woodstock. Um, and so instead of asking them to just write and talk and uh, whatnot for this particular assignment, I asked them to create their own festival poster. Um, and I think uh, it was a really great opportunity for them to get a little creative, but also make sure that they have the information from the festival. Uh, so as you see, the poster should include the name of it, some art, and uh, a description of the event in some way or another. And then I asked them to kind of discuss what, why they made the choices they made. So I just wanted to share a couple of these because I thought they were really exciting um, in different ways. So this is one, I love just the, the collage aspect. Again, this is, I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not asking them to be. Jen, you can critique them on a different level if you wanted at a future date, but uh, you know, it captures everything. You have the last dance of 1969 for anyone who's familiar with this festival, that's really, um, that, that's the takeaway. So they really um, distilled that really, really nicely. Um, I like this particular example here because they added a little bit of context through everything we're going on, that's going on around us, come for music and peace and unity. Uh, and again, all the information is here uh, that we wanna have. I love this. I don't know if this is original art. Uh, I would love to, if they did, if the student did this on their own, I would love to get more of their work because I love it, uh, you know, and obviously there's, you know, the contrast is not amazing, but the ideas are there. I love the, the, um, how they're presenting the, the information. Um, and this is just one last example here. And um, again, this is the, the student looked at other posters, obviously looked at the lectures because they have inf information that is not on, you know, a lot of these other uh, posters, the cost of the tickets, how to buy tickets. That's, that's right. That's what was, what happened at the at the event um so it made them dig a little bit deeper um and it uh allowed them to kind of get creative again and i don't i didn't care if they, they didn't have to make their own art they could just grab something they, they could just google it as long as they cited where they got their their art from um because you know some people will love to do things like this and some people it's just not in their wheelhouse but uh, i wanted to be able to meet them wherever they were with this assignment one more uh, minute, Sean. One more minute. Okay, then I'm gonna skip. You're gonna lose. You're gonna miss out on the actual um, audio experience here. But uh, so we'll just stay with this. Uh, so the last uh, assignment, um, and there were a few others that we did, but I last one I wanted to share was um, we created a play posit video um, for my um, '80s lecture. So this is I want my MTV is the name of this play posit assignment, uh, and I'm showing you the instructor instructor view because it's a lot easier to interact with uh, in this um, exp this. Uh, setting. Uh, so essentially, this is a video where I took a bunch of different clips from YouTube that were from the first five years of MTV uh, and kind of worked them in together. Uh, I would added these questions so that the students are reacting to the, the videos themselves. Uh, and then I, there's also an open forum in this unit where they have a chance to uh, talk about anything they want from the module. And this was one of the things they talked about more often than not. So there is the first, it starts with the launch of MTV, uh, that was the very, this is literally the very first seconds of MTV. This is how it began for anyone who wasn't around August 8th, 2000, uh, sorry, August 1st, 1981. Um, we move on to some Cindy Lauper girls just want to have fun. Who doesn't love that? Uh, we skip ahead to Kate Bush's video for running up that hill because, you know, it is where kids actually know this. It's actually, on, you know, pop radio. We'll not take advantage of that because um, Kate Bush is also addressed in the uh, the lecture in in the module itself. And then I close this section with a really fascinating. And if you have never seen this, I really recommend you check it out. Um, David Bowie being interviewed by Mark Goodman on MTV. I believe this is 1984, give or take. Um, and Bowie basically calls out MTV's um, resistance to playing black artists and kind of uh, being the, a format for, for positive change. And you can see here just in the question, Mark Goodman talks a little bit about how we have to broadcast to the whole country. And there's a lot of people that would be scared of Prince. Well, why would they be scared of Prince, Mark? Um, and Bowie really kind of uh, does a great job of that. So. 
that's a quick overview of what we did with uh, what, how we took the most of these opportunities that Kevin presented for us. And um, thanks, pass it back to Kevin. Great, thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, that's great. I, I get so excited looking at these redesign. I, I have so many more ideas that I can share with other instructors. So um, I'm gonna ask Dina uh, Novak if uh, you wouldn't mind uh, just saying a few words um, about whatever you heard here or anything else you wanna, wanna talk about. Sure. Um, so from our perspective on the TLT side of it, the thing that I really want to uh, emphasize about this experience and this process was that it was really such a collaboration. Um, I'm sure that comes through in the way that um, Sean talks about working with Natalia, Natalia talks about working with Sean, and Jennifer talks about working with Karen. Our instructional designers really work very, very closely with the instructors of each of these courses to um, personalize the experience, meet them where they are in terms of their readiness, what they wanna do with the course, where the course is, and where there are areas to make it even better. Um, the process of this redesign is not about, you know, figuring out what's wrong with the course. It's more about looking, about looking at what's great in the course and how we can really optimize that and how we can enhance the student experience so that they are getting the most out of the content that the instructors are bringing in and their expertise. Um, and that's really where the instructional design partnership is focused, is making that student experience as rich as possible so that the students are able to benefit from the knowledge and the expertise and the ideas that the instructor is bringing to the table. Um, and so if you are interested in doing this kind of program redesign or even course redesign, um, that's really the approach that we try to use, is really uh, deeply collaborative and deep partnership um, that's really customized to where you are as the instructor and what you're hoping uh, your students to get out of the course. So it's really been a pleasure for us and we're, we're happy to work with you. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. All right, thank you, Dina. Um, so. So I just want to say, as, as I'm going to I'm going to kind of um, ping pong around, but if anyone uh, out there in the virtual landscape wants to post a comment or has a question uh, while we're talking, feel free to, to put something up there um, that we can respond to. Um, otherwise, Natalia, I just wanted to ask you, since you worked so closely with Sean, um, you know, were there were there any. Um, challenges or particular um, exciting moments that, that you had in working with, with Sean or Sean, same thing. What, what, what was the actual partnership like and how often did you work together? How long was the process? Yes, um, we met every week uh, for about one hour and that's, um, we did that like, I guess for semester uh, or even longer to follow up. And like I said, we started with a review. We based our review on uh, uh, quality matters, uh, you know, principles, gu guidelines, and we just went uh, one session at a the time. And then we looked at the existing course, what was so great about it. And like I said, he already had very, uh, very good and rich course. And so we kind of start, start thinking about realignment, then we start thinking about how to make it more active learning based. As you saw those wonderful posters that Sean shared, that's definitely active learning uh, at, at its best. Students had to not only research, but create something. So we, we aim for developing assessments like that, not just quick, uh, you know, tests or quizzes or uh, papers that students might be already, you know, kind of bored with. So we, we were looking for um, exciting opportunities for students, and especially in in course of such, you know, such a creative program as uh, Rutgers Arts Online. It had to be special. So um, the challenges for us, I, I can't really, I can't really have a challenge. Uh, remember, don't remember a lot of challenges. Um, Sean was very. Um, excited to collaborate and he also had a special knack for design he understood exactly what i mean by alignment he went right on he just really did a fabulous job so i don't know maybe sean had challenges with me but i didn't have any challenges with him and we really um and we're really just looking for for a better more more exciting and enriched course and i think we achieved that i mean we're still doing this sometimes checking in with each other does does group discussion work does group project uh going well does uh, we also incorporated other 
tools such as hypothesis for social uh, reading. Is that going well? Do students participate? So there's a lot of little details we had to address to. And also I have to say that Sean was not only responsible for his own course, he also was leading uh, another course that was you know, taught by another instructor. So he was kind of doing both and, and I see the best I could. And we still continue being in touch, you know, things, uh, as course running once or twice or three times, things could come up because different uh, set of students will be in different challenges or different situations. So it's kind of an ongoing long-term relationship. It's not just quick fix. So I hope uh, uh, Sean agrees. <laughs> Uh, no, it was it's it was a great experience, and um, I think one of the main things for me was knowing that there's this resource, there's this person here who's out there who can help me through these this process. I think the challenges for me were really um, stepping back from something I'd done for so long, um, and you know, it's not like I'd never tweaked or changed things, but um, to really get introduced to new ways of thinking about how I can. Um, share the material um, and rethink the material, coming up with uh, learning objectives, course like module level learning objectives made me rethink all of the content to a certain extent because they're there, they were there. I you know, I had a sense of what I wanted them to get out of each lecture, but never really articulated it in a way that we had to do it here. And that really helped make the assessments better, make the exams better. I could make it more, it was more apparent not only to me, but to the students what we're what we're looking for um, and what success looks like in the course. Um, so yeah, for me, a lot of it was that taking a step back, taking a deep breath when I'm thinking like, what does this have to, you know, who doesn't hit some resistance change, right? But but taking that moment to be like, okay, I now I like, how can we, how can this factor into my course positively? And then what do I do with that? Um, and where does it take me? And it was, um, it was probably a great, it was a great experience for me in that it was something new, um, after doing a lot of the same for a long time. Great, thanks. Jen, I have a question for you. Um, do you do, do you have any sense? I, I know, you know, I know how challenging being an instructor for an asynchronous course can be because you as an instructor don't have the immediacy of mm -hmm. engagement with the student, but do you have any sense at all, either with the assignments or with the platform? of any kind of difference for yourself as a, as a teacher or, or of the student experience? Is there, is there any, anything you can say about your own experience or the experience of students in that regard? Um, well, and it, it's funny because of course I've come from to hear from like almost the exact opposite spaces, Sean, in that like I didn't have any experience really before the template. Um, I shouldn't say any, but I had, I had limited experience that said, um, one of the things that I find that the uh, new template affords, the new organization, not just the widgets and doodads and skin that's over it, but um, the organization facilitates me being able to direct um, students. If they come to me with a question, I'm not, I have places to direct them and it's very clear where to send them to get their answers within the template um, because things have a certain look right it's not like you know just a wall of black text and so i find that that's a lot easier um i've had students actually re remark that oh it looks different or you know this is this feels comfortable um uh, so that's certainly nice feedback to get um and you know like i said i think that the template also is helping me um, have a very, um, it, it helps me organize the, the material when I'm putting it in from the back end. And my class actually is, you know, when working with uh, the instructional designer, um, the, my class is very different. It's a di different than some of the other ARIO classes in that it's a making class, right? Students are actually um, always making things. Uh, every every project is is something that they're generating um, using technology. So um, the what what Karen helped me do is to see how um, how the the alignments could actually make that more accessible for them. Um, but uh, yeah, that's basically my experience. Great. Thank you. 
Well, I, th I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, I don't see any comments. I think we've uh, said what we, we need to say here. People can take a little bathroom and water break before the next session at 11. Um, but I want to thank all of my uh, collaborators here. And I want to thank uh, Justin Smith, who's behind the scenes doing our uh, technology, putting up all our banners. And um, yeah, we hope this was uh, informative and, and useful for some of you out there. And of course, uh, our uh, emails are all online. You can find us uh, if we can be of service in any way. So have a great rest of the conference, everyone. Thanks, uh, Dina, Jen, Natalia, and Sean. I appreciate your, your efforts here. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat>